Hello, welcome to Resuscitation NYC style. I am not, as you can tell, from New York. I am here to keep the peace and to make some money during the inevitable onslaught of bad language. <laughs> I'm also here to pour the drinks. There is only one rule, and that is no ad hominem attacks. Yeah, you, you folks all know what ad hominem attacks are. We're going to go after the ideas and not after the person that stated them. Uh, regarding the rule that there be no ad hominem attacks, um, I didn't agree to that rule. <laughs> also, some would say that to stipulate that there be no ad hominem attacks suggests uh, an insecurity that might, may, might have arisen from a smallness of intellectual stature <laughs> or, or physical stature or some other anatomic challenge. <laughs> some might say that. Not me necessarily, but, but some. So what is New York style resuscitation, Scott? A New York style resuscitation. It's gritty, it's brash, it's sometimes wrong, but never unsure. <laughs> it might even be American style resuscitation. It's errors of commission rather than errors of omission. What separates New York City from the rest is how angry our patients are. <laughs> um, in most emergency departments, at least, in most places, patients start to get angry after waiting to be seen four, five, six hours. In New York City, patients actually start out angry and just get <laughs> angrier. And, not just that, they're not just that they're angry, they're also assholes. <laughs> there are so many assholes in New York City, <laughs> so many angry assholes. And it's not just the patients, the doctors are also assholes. Okay, so let's think about a patient scenario. <laughs> Maybe leave the assholes out of it. Um, the crashing patient with pulmonary edema. So here's your situation. It's a 75-year-old. The blood pressure is 210 over 160. The heart rate is 120, and there are crackles up to the clavicles. What are you going to do? Okay, so this is hypertensive pulmonary edema, or what Scott calls SCAPE, sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. This is really gratifying to treat because you can turn these patients around really quickly and look like a magician. Scape is the nursemaid's elbow of the recess room. There are two key therapies in, in hypertensive pulmonary edema. There's non-invasive ventilation and nitroglycerin. Nitro has to be prepared and drawn up and given intravenously, and that takes time. And I don't mind if you spray a few sprays of nitro under the tongue, or uh, apply some nitro paste, but it's probably not going to save the day because peripheral perfusion is clamped down in hypertensive pulmonary edema. And I've also always found nitro paste a little bit weird and kind of disgusting in this scenario. Um, you like, are in the midst of dealing with this diaphoretic, gasping for air patient, and you say something like, you know, ma'am, I'm just going to take down your gown and lather some ointment all over your chest. <laughs> Doesn't that feel nice? You know, I know you can't breathe. But doesn't that feel nice? So what you want to start out with in hypertensive pulmonary edema is non-invasive ventilation. You actually want to start out with NIV in all patients with respiratory distress. If the problem turns out to be SCAPE, then non-invasive ventilation is going to fix that problem. If it turns out to be something else, non-invasive is probably going to help. And if it doesn't help, with NIV, you're doing the best pre-oxygenation in preparation for RSI. In order to do this and to realize the benefits of NIV on the sickest patients, you need to be ready to do it immediately as soon as a patient hits the door. And that means you need to be cognitively and materially prepared with your machine, the masks, the tubes, everything ready in your recess zone, and you don't have to make any calls. You can just do it immediately by yourself. NIV is an intubation-sparing, 
life-saving therapy in these cases in respiratory distress. And so if you and your department don't have the capability to set it up immediately by yourself, you need to get the capability to set it up immediately by yourself. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, this was the first podcast we did on MCRIP because you need the logistics to make it happen. But no matter how many times I beg people to just fight to have a non-invasive machine or a ventilator in their department ready to go, in many places it just doesn't happen. But you could still avert intubation in these patients. And the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna beg someone in your hospital to give you a box of PEEP valves. Now the PEEP valves fit on every single BVM out there, but the problem is they're absolute shit. <laughs> Thank you. This is all going to charity. Um, they don't work. They're a useless, useless device. And uh, if you don't believe me, you could test it out with a pressure gauge and find it out yourself. If you put a PEEP valve on a BVM and have the patient breathe, they might have a few brief seconds during their exhalation where they're actually generating PEEP or CPAP, and the rest of the time they're back to zero. It's useless. But if you put a nasal cannula on the patient, you crank it up to 15, and then hold a nice two-hand mask seal on the BVM with a P-valve, you could dial in the exact CPAP you want, and no matter what the patient's doing, they will be fixing their acute pulmonary edema. So just having those things available, the BVM, the nasal cannula, and peep valves will allow you to immediately put a patient on CPAP. Non-invasive ventilation is gonna carry most of the weight in your treatment of SCAPE. The second therapy, the key, second key therapy in hypertensive pulmonary edema is nitroglycerin. When I trained, uh, we were taught to start nitro at 10 to 20 mics per min, which is worthless. So we intubated a lot of those patients, some of whom died and would be alive today if we knew how to dose nitro. Actually, I trained a long time ago so they wouldn't be alive today, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the way to dose nitro in hypertensive pulmonary edema is to go big or go home. And the more hypertensive and sicker the patient, the bigger you have to go or the more home you have to go. <laughs> and in the truly crashing scape patient, you do best with a bolus. And I dose one milligram bolus, one milligram of nitroglycerin over a few seconds. And there's literature to support two milligram boluses. So feel free, instead of dosing 20 mics per min, which is what many of us were trained to do, to push 2,000 micrograms as an intravenous bolus. In scape, go big with nitro. Yeah, I totally agree. And if you're scared to draw it up, if you're worried about medication error, then the drip that the nurses bring to the bedside could also give those exact same doses. You just crank the pump, the pump up to 400 micrograms per minute, and you let it run two minutes, three minutes, that'll give you 800, 1200 micrograms, and then dial it back to 100 or 150, and you'll get the exact same effect as Ruben's push. Uh, there's one more therapy to keep in mind. In the crashing, severely volume overloaded hemodialysis patient who presents in extremis a pulmonary edema foaming from the mouth, you needs to be intubated immediately, now there's pulmonary edema, coming from the tube and you're suctioning and you can't keep up and you can't oxygenate and the patient is gonna die unless he gets stat dialysis, which means he's gonna die. There is a therapy, a heroic maneuver that has unfortunately lost favor in the past 500 years and that is therapeutic phlebotomy. Pull 200, 300, 400 mils of blood from your volume overloaded crashing hemodialysis patient and watch him turn around. Fuck. You're now advocating <laughs> bloodletting. Fuck yes, I am. <laughs> you gotta tweet that out. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so now let's think about um, uh, a different patient, a 50-year-old patient, bilateral pneumonia. You've decided to intubate and the blood pressure was great, 110 over 70, but immediately post-intubation, it plummets to 60 over 40, so what next? Okay, so um, patients at the end of their physiologic rope like to decompensate and die around intubation. Now, we think, we don't know, there's not great science, but we think that you can save some of these peri-intubation arrests, firstly by resuscitating prior to intubating, addressing the underlying problem with antibiotics, blood, pericardiosynthesis, whatever, but also by using inotropes and vasopressors to support the patient's physiology 
before, during, and after intubation. What I use in this context is an epinephrine drip. I'm going to call it epinephrine. I, I know it's fashionable these days to pretend you're not American, but I'm going to take ownership of that and our president, who's a New Yorker, remember what I said about New Yorkers, and I'm going to call it <laughs> epinephrine, even though we're uh, in a much more civilized country of Germany. So I start an epi drip, and uh, we could argue all day about vasopressor choice. Right now, norepinephrine is everyone's darling drip. It used to be dopamine. Phenylephrine had its 15 minutes of fame. Maybe vasopressin is next, or angiotensin. Everyone has their theoretical pharmacodynamic receptor-based reasons why they choose one over another, and it's probably all nonsense. I like epinephrine, okay? I just like it. When I was training, I was with a Russian anesthesiologist as a med student who hated me. Can't, can't imagine why. And we were taking care of a, a very sick patient, and he started an epidrip, and I said, why epinephrine? And he glared at me and said, is physiologic. <laughs> that was good enough for me. Since then, I like epinephrine, and I start epidrips on lots of crashing, hypotensive sick patients, and it seems to work. Now, the right way to do this, the best way to do this, is to put a formal drip on a pump, but many of these patients are going to be pulseless by the time that you can get that set up. So I recommend the dirty epi drip. It is dirty. You grab one amp of, of uh, epinephrine from the crash cart, that's one milligram, add it to the liter of crystalloid that's already hanging on your patient, shake it up, and you are good to go. If you need more epinephrine, you just dial it up. If you're getting too much epi effect, you just turn it down. Once you have a little bit more time, you can ask your nurses to change that over to a formal drip on a pump. But until then, get down and dirty. One milligram of epinephrine and one liter of saline. Shake it up. That's the dirty epi drip. I, I would go a slightly different way. Uh, on our intubation checklist, we would have already had drawn up push dose epinephrine, 10 micrograms per ml in a labeled syringe with graduations on the sides, so you know exactly how much you're giving. And if the patient dropped their blood pressure, we would be able to respond immediately. Peri-intubation hypotension is incredibly high. Uh, there's an incredibly high association with cardiac arrest. You need to respond instantly, and I agree with Ruben on that, but I wouldn't be doing it with a unmeasured, unlabeled method. I would just take the syringe and push exactly how much I want. Push dose pressers. Indeed. Uh, push dose pressers are dumb, and <laughs> Scott voted for Donald Trump. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> These agents, they last for seconds to minutes in the circulation, and they don't fix the problem. They just maybe uh, improve circulation, improve tissue perfusion while you fix the problem with other therapies. So unless you can fix the problem with other therapies in seconds to minutes, which you never can, it just doesn't make sense to push dose epinephrine phenylephrine, vitamin C, or whatever. You need a drip. Also, trainees who carry around an epi stick or a neo stick in their pocket and love to use it, they emerge from their training thinking that the proper response to hypotension is to push dose oppressor. And that is a, a misguided understanding of hypotension and vasopressors. Push dose pressors are for Trump voters. Start a drip. <laughs> I did not vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe that. But Ruben was the character reference for my shotgun license. So I guess <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I guess I have to take some blame. Um, this, in its name, describes the problem with this dirty epi drip. This is a reiteration of what so many other specialties think of emergency medicine slipshod, half assed just getting the job done, but thank you, Nat, but, but not doing it in a precise fashion. And I think the most telling question was when Ruben presented this concept of the dirty epi drip to my residency, one very smart resident asked, how exactly do you order that in the chart after the patient gets better? <laughs> dirty epi drip times one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
I think it's probably the perfect time for us to call it quits. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Could we have a round of applause for Nat for coming up here and protecting me? Uh, well, there's questions about the dirty epi drip. Like, are you, would you titrate it by number of drops or, or whatnot? But I think, I think you've addressed that. Someone was asking about ACE inhibitors then. That was part of the sort of um, more advanced scape cocktail, if you will. So anyone want a recommendation for an ACE inhibitor? Yeah, so I used to use these, but the problem is you don't know exactly the effect you're getting. So now I'd rather titrate the nitroglycerin, get the patient better. Where ACE inhibitors come in for me is you have these patients, you've weaned back their nitro, they're markedly better, they're still on 20, 30 micrograms, and you're just like, wow, it would be great if I could put them on a regular ward and not have to send them on a drip. And at that point, I might add in ACE inhibitors and see if that's enough with that arterial vasodilation to actually be able to finally turn off the nitro drip. Just one more question, uh, another one that's a great one, and it comes up a lot, is so you get them on the non-invasive, you ramp up your drip quickly. What's your time sequence of pulling things back so the hope is you can get them to a regular floor and not the ICU every single time. Right, well as I mentioned, the great thing with SCAPE is that you can turn these patients around really quickly. So the, the key in the super acute phase when their blood pressure is through the roof and they look terrible is that the physician or their provider um, needs to be standing at bedside, blood pressure, Q2, three minutes, watching the patient, and you'll find that these patients turn around super quick and so often these patients can go to an unmonitored setting after a couple of hours. Thank you.